very short. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mac. Um, I'm Michelle Smith. I'm the operations director here. And uh, it's great to see so many colleagues um, from all around uh, everywhere. Um, so Julie's Bicycle have asked me to do a little bit of an introduction. I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Mac, um, but I'm sure other people aren't. So I'll just give you a, a brief snapshot. Um, we've been here for over, well over 50 years now. Um, we started in the park uh, as a young people's centre in the early 60s. And slowly through the 70s and early 80s, that developed into a sort of full-blown art centre. Um, we are in a very unique location, and we still really do focus on an awful lot of family work and work for young people. Um, we have now over one million footfall every year, so it's a busy old place. Um, and we're open every day apart from Christmas Day, um, which is quite relentless sometimes. Um, we're doing some tours later for people who want to look, look around in a bit more detail, but I, I always try and describe this building as a TARDIS. Um, nothing's enormous within the building, but there's an awful lot of spaces. So we have a very, very busy programme, uh, theatre, dance, music, um, e exhibitions, both in formal galleries and also, very importantly, in the public spaces. Um, we have a vast learning and participation programme, which is quite often quite hidden away, but in the term time, there's 140 courses every week. Um, and then we have summer schools, and we have also quite a, a wide range of free workshops in the public spaces. Um, as I'm sure many of you do, we also run our own commercial trading company, um, which helps support the, the, the charity and the arts work that we do. Um, so that's all our catering and conferencing and hires and retail. Um, after many failed attempts, um, and the building really was falling apart about 12 years ago, um, we finally managed to put together a £15 million uh, capital project. We couldn't afford to knock the whole thing down and rebuild, so the building that you see now is partly new and partly refurbished old building, and that brings with it challenges. Um, but it's a far, far better in terms of access and also lots of environmental improvements. Um, and so we reopened about seven years ago. Um, obviously, seven years on, we're now looking at replacing things, but um, it's been a great improvement uh, and very successful. Um, not long after we opened, we formed our own green group. So we reviewed our environmental policy and we created an action plan. And um, at that point, I asked for volunteers throughout the organisation if they'd like to be involved in that green group. And we have a very enthusiastic, committed, cross-departmental group of volunteers who meet roughly every two months. And we go through the action plan, we come up with lots of ideas, and um, we've managed to achieve quite a few, um, as ever, with limited funds. So uh, since we reopened, we've installed solar panels. Um, we've worked on various transport schemes, cycling, public transport, um, with the City Council and other partners. Um, we've created, as you'll probably just walked past, a green area in the foyer, uh, which some, has some of that solar panel information uh, running on a plasma screen, but it also has uh, other information and, and recycling areas as well. Um, and uh, this afternoon uh, at one of the workshops, Lizzie, my colleague, who's head of tech resources, um, will talk a bit more about some of our work. But we've also just installed um, a voltage optimizer, um, which controls energy and will, touch wood, save us quite a bit of money. So um, I think our action plan is always quite ambitious and we can't afford everything. So we work very hard with our fundraising team and uh, we're currently working with the fundraising team and um, the Wildlife Trust to look at an educational space um, for young people on our terrace. Now, it's all dependent on whether we're successful with the various funding bids, but it's, it's an example of how we try and work in partnership with different organisations. Um, I know Sustainability West Midlands are here today. We've worked quite a bit with them, um, and we also work with people like Northfield Eco Centre, and also our very kind of unique location. We work very closely with the park, um, and groups that work in the park as well. Um, so that's, that really is a tiny snapshot. Um, 
we are running a couple of tours over lunchtime, um, and uh, I hope to meet more of you and, and talk a bit more about our work and find out what you do a bit later as well. We're always happy to meet with people and, and, and talk and compare how we work and uh, other improvements we can make. So I hope you have a lovely day, and uh, I will pass you back to Julie's bicycle. Thank you. Thank you to Michelle for that great welcome. Um, welcome to Mac Birmingham. Welcome to this Julie's Bicycle event. And also welcome to everyone who's watching on the live stream. Um, this is just a reminder that the event is being live streamed as well. And as part of that, we are also live subtitling it. So for any speakers, um, just as a reminder, speak slowly and into the microphones um, so that the subtitlers can pick it up. Um, just uh, as a quick bit of housekeeping, there are no fire alarms or anything like that scheduled for today. So if one does go off, um, then I would ask you to make your way calmly towards the exit. Um, our closest fire exit is out the doors towards the right. Um, there are a couple of Mac event stewards who will be around to help us with that as well. If anyone does need the loos, there are some just outside here to the right. Um, and anything else, please ask me or anyone else of the Judy's Bicycle staff who are dotted about or any of the Mac um, Birmingham staff. Um, also, I'd like to just pass on apologies from Alison, who is our founder, um, who is sadly unable to join us today. Um, but you get me instead. So hi, my name is Chiara. Um, I work at Julie's Bicycle. Um, and the reason we're here today is that two years ago, Arts Council England asked us to pull together some guidance for organisations embarking on capital development projects um, to support especially organisations applying for funding through their large and small capital grants programme um, on how they could better embed environmental sustainability into their projects. Um, the outcome of that was our Fit for the Future guide, which you can download for free on our website, um, which isn't just relevant to organisations applying for Arts Council capital grants, but just generally anyone looking to undertake any kind of work. Um, last year, we then partnered with the Fit for the Future network for an event at the Lyric Hammersmith in London to talk just about cultural buildings and capital development for an entire day. Um, at the time, we thought, is that really going to get people out to us for a whole day, um, but we were full up within two weeks of announcing. Um, so we gathered over 100 cultural professionals for a whole day, um, which basically brings us here because we knew that we couldn't end the conversation there. Um, in part, the level of engagement around this makes immediate sense. Um, capital projects, by definition, whether they're new builds, refurbishments, retrofits, or upgrades, involve large sums of money. So it's only prudent to consider all the impacts of that investment and what can be achieved with it. Um, inevitably, building or even equipment investment means thinking long-term. And when you start, consider, start to consider different timescales, it suddenly becomes necessary to look at, for example, the UK Climate Change Act, which commits us to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2025 in a much more immediate light. Um, there's also a really clear link between potential energy savings and potential financial savings to be realized, which is a pretty good incentive to make sure that all pos possible efficiencies have been explored. And lastly, the, the energy use of our buildings is one of the cultural sector's largest areas of carbon impact, so it's a logical place to focus our efforts. But there is also another part to this story, one that sees climate change as a defining challenge of the 21st century, one that is composed of a huge, sometimes really overwhelming seeming interconnected web of complexities that really goes straight to the heart of our societies, our way of life, our relationship to one another, other living things and the systems of our planet. And when we see climate change in that way, we recognize not just the problem, but also the urgency of taking action and that it is incumbent on us to take action and acknowledge it as a business critical issue and see climate change woven through everything that we do as cultural institutions and creatives, because it's the current reality that we work and exist in. And it's really, it's something that's not just a climate issue, but it's also a justice issue. It is a women's rights issue. It's a housing issue. It's an inequality issue, a poverty issue, a conflict issue, a refugee issue, and a cultural issue. It's a what kind of world do we want issue. 
And there at the edge of that what kind of world do we want question is a growing movement across the arts and cultural industries asking that question in the context of climate change and expressing itself in a range of ways that are as diverse as the sector itself. It's our buildings, it's our people, and it's our creativity. It's organizations creating a thread from a single employee turning off a light at the end of the day, all the way to what we put on stages, how we relate to our audiences, and how we see our cultural venues as part of broader systems. At a time of really great global uncertainty, when the optimism of reaching an international global agreement on climate change is facing off against the political realities of having a climate change denier in one of the most powerful positions in global politics, and plenty more people in positions of power, seemingly not quite ready to grasp the urgency of what limiting global temperatures rise to two degrees, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius, actually means. It can be tempting to step back and pretend that we, it has nothing to do with us and there's nothing that we can do. The thing is, we also have power and opportunity in this context. We still have the power to make our own decisions, invent new ways of doing things, experiment, inspire, and come up with our own answers for what kind of world do we want and also for what can I do to make it happen. Buildings are more than just brick and mortar. They are in and of themselves living and breeding things with an inner and outer life of their own. Our cultural venues do shape what takes place within them and they are symbols to the rest of the world. They do act as beacons of our values. And I think everyone in this room thinks and believes this is true, at least at our very best but that means that it is incumbent on us to make sure that those beacons genuinely reflect what we think our values are as a sector. And that is our purpose, ultimately, in switching off lights, changing light bulbs, and in installing solar panels, in creating nooks and crannies for birds and insects, in wrangling with building management systems. And that really is what Judy's Bicycle has found in the 10 years that we've been going. Yes, it is 10 years this year. Um, for those who don't know, in 2012, Arts Council England made environmental reporting and the development of environmental policies a funding requirement for their regularly funded organisations. And we've been working very closely with them in that time in translating that very light touch policy with arts organisations across England through support, through resources and events, of which this is one. Just asking organisations to account for their environmental impacts has prompted the conditions for creative, practice practical, operational, and even financial change in a way that has rippled through to artists and audiences. It is this ebb and flow between action and purpose that fosters creative change bit by bit by bit. Wherever you are on this journey, whether it's taking your first tentative steps or whether you're a seasoned expert who sometimes think that you've seen and heard it all, we do hope today that we will together take a few steps further by sharing ideas, expertise, confidence, critical questions, and encouragement. Um, some of the really big questions we're going to be framing today's event around are, what role does the cultural building of the future play um, in a civic sense, in a creative sense, in an environmental sense? What role can the cultural estate play in some of today's biggest transitions and challenges, whether that's sustainable cities or renewable energy infrastructure? How do we translate the Paris Agreement of limiting global temperature change to two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius through our buildings? What does that actually look like day to day in practice. Um, what kinds of partnerships and support from funders and also policymakers do we need to turn that vision of a sustainable cultural estate into reality? And how can our buildings embody our pur pur purpose and our values and grow and foster them? So small questions, um, but to begin with, um, to start ooh, hopefully uh, getting us to help come up with some answers to that. Um, let me welcome Steve Tompkins, co-founder of Hayworth Tompkins Architects, and Simon Curtis, uh, production manager of the Royal Exchange Theatre and steering group member of Manchester A Certain Future, um, up to the stage. Um, so just to give a really brief introduction, although he may or may not need one, um, Steve Tompkins is a founding director of Hayworth Tompkins Architects. Um, he has been kind enough to come join us today. Um, his architectural practice really has revolutionized the way that sustainability is built into our cultural estate. Um, you may or may not be aware of numerous of the projects that he's been involved with, with the National Theatre, the Everyman and Playhouse Theatres in Liverpool, the Young Wick, Oldborough Music, Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, um, the North Wall Performing Arts Centre, Battersea Arts Centre, the Bush Theatre, Theatre Royal Bath and Chichester Festival Theatre. 
He's currently working on projects with the London Theatre Company, the Donmar Theatre, Bristol Old Vic, the really useful group, um, NEMAX, ATG, St. John Smith Square, and the Perth Schools Performing Arts Centre in Cambridge. So um, if there is anyone who could tell us something about buildings, it is Steve. <laughs> Just go on there, okay, fine, thanks. Sure. Morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, really pleased to be here. Um, Kara's expressed incredibly eloquently what's at stake in this conversation in, in the wider sense. That cultural buildings, we all know, we wouldn't be here if we didn't know that cultural buildings aren't just about putting on performances, events for the arts. They're much, much more important. They're much more embedded in the crucial conversations which we're all going to face up to in the next years, half generation, generation to come. Cultural stock is potentially the place where we can play out what it means to have a society, what it means to be a cultured set of human beings. I think the cultural stock can help us to express our common humanity, it can help us to create sites of resilience and resistance in a world that feels increasingly fractured, which feels increasingly dysfunctional, increasingly at odds with a lot of the things which we all find crucial, important, germane to being human beings, being part of a society which is in conversation with each other. So. Cultural buildings are, I think, one of the key sites where we can start to talk about a different sort of future for our society as well as for the arts, and sustainability is a huge part of that. Sustainable cultural buildings, there are two aspects to that, aren't there? One is what we mean by cultural buildings. What do they do? What are they for? How do they work? How do they join up? Sustainability, I think, is, of course, not just about energy, but it, that is important. Part of the problem I think we've had in the last few years is that the definition of sustainability has probably been too narrow. Certainly for architects and design teams and people procuring buildings, Briam, whatever, excellent, outstanding, has been the thing which guides a lot of our thinking. If we're interested in sustainability, if we want funding, if we want local authorities to buy into the projects which we're doing, that can sometimes be the be-all and end-all. The problem with that is that sometimes the little homemade venue built by volunteer labour couldn't afford double glazing, but it's packed out every night, it's got a real buzz, it's embedded in cultural memory in the processes of a local population. It's far more effective than a huge purpose-built hangar. Yes, it's pretty am outstanding. Yes, it's super insulated. Yes, it's enormous, and by the, the metric of kilowatts per square metre, which is how building sustainability is often couched, the big hangar, which is not fit for purpose, therefore empty, therefore unused, therefore unheated, is going to score top marks against the tiny venue, which pisses energy, everybody loves it, it's packed out every night, it's in everybody's forefront of everybody's minds when they think about having a good time, when they think about being part of their local community, their local society. It's what arts venues crave when they err towards found spaces, which are packed with layers and layers of micro-narratives and prehistories, as opposed to the new venue, which many arts organisations walk into, and they're frankly bewildered and dismayed because the signal that comes off those buildings is corporate, is monetized, is consumerist and manipulative. So something has gone wrong in the past with the way we procure our cultural stock. It's become a sort of arms race of gimmicks, of new formal tricks, of how we can lever more and more money out of trust foundations, local authorities, and government funding organizations. It can't carry on like that, and I think it's changing. I, I've seen a huge amount of change in the time that we've been building buildings over the last 20 years or so, I think there's a much more intelligent dialogue being brought to bear. And part of that is about taking the time to understand, to be in conversation, to actually get to the point where we know that we are spending money, resources, and energy to maximum effect. Um, my 
metric for that um, is joy per kilowatt. And by joy, I mean all the things that Kara's been talking about. I don't just mean entertainment, of course. I mean cultural value, depth, the things that are germane to culture. And kilowatts, I mean carbon, energy, resource expenditure. So what if we think about joy per kilowatt as a metric for cultural buildings, as opposed to pounds per square meter, kilowatts per hour, et cetera, et cetera. The two things are crucial. Yes, we need sustainable buildings. Yes, we need to bring down our cost of use. Yes, we need to bring down embodied energy of our new buildings. Yes, we need to think about whole life cycle costings. But more importantly than all of that is when we spend energy and resources, are we getting the density of cultural result that we're looking for? So I think there are a number of strategies for that. There is no single strategy for building the perfect sustainable cultural venue. Everybody will have their own conversation and circumstances. I just want to offer some observations in what's left of, of 10 minutes to get a conversation started, really. So it's, in a way, it's a little aid memoir about strategies. So small fabrications. You know, this is a temporary building, part of a much bigger 10-year reimagining of the National Theatre, which we don't really have time to talk about much. But I just wanted to mention that the shed was transformative of that project in so many ways. It was there for a couple of years, but it transformed the National's view of itself as an organisation. It transformed the way the audiences appreciate the building, the way the audiences had a way in to what can sometimes seem an impenetrable, hermetic, potentially elitist institution. It opened the doors. It allowed a different language and a different sensibility to infiltrate the building. And it allowed Rufus and um, Ben Power and, and, and their teams to express a different proposition to the cultural community and to the public at large. Tiny thing made out of wood, put together with four by twos and sort of Travis Perkins insulating panels, nothing at all sophisticated about the way it was built, except that we wanted it to be off-grid, we wanted it to be completely naturally ventilated, hence the form of the building, which also, of course, has cultural um, and um, semiotic purpose. And the fact that this building expresses its, its purpose is also a, in a, a, a rather a, um, an intriguing, rather laconic sculptural form. It does interesting things. It, it has a cultural voice of its own. And the interior, very simple, setting up interesting conversations, commandeering found space of the foyers. This is an external terrace which we just boxed in temporarily. And of course, crucially, it has a performance space at the heart of it where we felt really truthful conversations and transactions could take place between performers and audiences. Um, I think Rufus coined the phrase, um, the honesty box for this space, which I, I think is, is, is a very true definition of it. The other thing we can do is, is take on existing buildings, temporary interventions, opportunistic processes, this is a, a building which we did with the Almeida many years ago, a building about to be developed, um, a power station in Shoreditch, beautiful building, very, very simple intervention, <coughs> rape seating, borrowed um, platforms, scaffolding, builders' lead lights, some turf on the stage, buckets where rain was coming through the roof, no real effort to make this anything other than just a really intense theatrical experience. So it's architecture as scenography. But in doing that, it created a real buzz. It sold out for a whole season. It remapped people's perception of that area. So apart from the event itself, it was able to change a perception of a neighborhood. And likewise, a year later in King's Cross, um, a less prepossessing starting point of a building, an old bus garage, but again, by using the, the language of scenography and set building and by commandeering the help of production teams, we were able to make a space very, very cheaply. Nobody would ever design this space permanently because it's kind of bonkers. It's too low, it's too wide, it's, it's, it's too everything compared with conventional wisdom. But it set up a fantastic year of events. And again, it changed the psychological map 
of the area. So very small interventions were able to deliver huge changes, both within the organisation and within the neighbourhood and the community which it was serving. We borrowed turf to cover the roof with and we gave it back after a year from the, from the turf company. Um, and it created this beautiful, intriguing exterior. The interior was just built by production crews. Um, no real contractor involved in the fit out, which means that the interior is the result of a whole set of really interesting relationships apart from everything else, which then went on to build the sets and the shows throughout the season. So there's a connectivity between the process of making the architecture and the process of making the work. And I think that disjunct is something which often is a cause of, of real stress and strife between the construction industry and the arts um, professions. Sometimes the answer is not to adapt to your own home, but simply to move. And architects and design teams need to get involved in those upstream processes just as much as, as in the nuts and bolts of design. The bush, we helped to move, we helped to find a new building. We were involved in conversations with the local authority, identifying an old library, very, very simply converting with a kind of improvisational process. The audience were involved, we invited them in to come and draw on the building, to sit down and take tea with us, work out what it was that they really wanted. And we ended up homemaking a lot of this interior. It was built for about 700,000 pounds all in this project, the first phase, and we're now completing a second phase. So by actually commandeering those processes of homemade DIY conversation as opposed to professional process, I think we got a much more interesting result. And certainly for the bush, we got a space which was far more suited to their identity. Architecture doesn't have to be visible. Sometimes I think it is just the reordering of the beauty and poetry of an existing found space. Snape Maltings um, on the Suffolk coast, beautiful, elegiac, poetic space. Some old buildings which we converted to concert hall and music use. The primary decision on this project was to do almost nothing visible, but simply to reorder the spaces, make them legal, curate the found material, drop in one new room in the centre of the plan, but that's all. And so the finished building almost looks like an empty found space. The point of this building was the, was the poetry and the quality of the landscape and the relationship of the existing architecture. So it doesn't need to be bling, it doesn't need to be a logo, it doesn't need to be the something or the something when the building is finished. It can just be beautiful, permissive, eloquent space. And I, and I think that's something that architects need to find their humility around building cultural buildings. Often the answer is to be almost invisible and for your presence to be almost indiscernible. The odd intervention here, and this was the new interior, talking to the landscape, using very simple materials. Occasionally there's the, the moment to just do something which has presence. This is an old dovecot um, ruin which we dropped a single studio into for a single performer um, to make work. And there's a, a live workspace as well, looking out over the marshes. So just simple, straightforward, small scale things can actually be much more effective, and much more eloquent than spending a huge amount of money um, on sophisticated messaging and marketing. We found that at the Young Vic, um, an organization which is hugely loved, massively invested in culturally, and very important in the, in the cultural memory of, it, of its neighborhood. Instead of knocking it down, we rebuilt, we regrew a new building around the old butcher's shop and the auditorium. These elements are crucial. They are the identity of the space. They couldn't be lost, otherwise, the point of the Young Vic to a great extent would have been lost. So in thinking about renewing, think about what it is that makes your buildings important. What is it that is the crucial thing, the thing that if you lost, so the point of the building would be gone. This became a really important, porous, cultural mixer. The whole community uses this building, not just people coming to shows. It's very open. In, in David Land's word, it is the place where strangers can meet in peace. And this surely is the purpose of, of cultural buildings, apart from anything else. It's also, incidentally, one of, I think one of the great performance rooms that we have. Nothing to do with us. The original performance space, I think, was and remains extraordinary. 
A process which I think is particularly interesting is one we've been in, embarked with at, at Battersea Arts Centre over the last 10 to 12 years, where we have sort of gone um, completely embedded in the organisation. We've tried to absolutely dissolve the boundaries between architects as hired professionals and the cultural organisation as clients. We work in there for 10 years, making small incremental changes, working with each artist making productions, tweaking away at the building, allowing the whole territory of this huge building to become performance space. So previously there were three performance spaces, now there are about 80. And scraping back the texture, adding small interventions, working with the staff, working with the carpenters, setting up the conditions whereby the organisation can remake itself rather than being reliant on ex external agencies. And making small interventions, small artistic tweaks, things which take away the pomposity of the space and add to its playfulness, the sense that anything is possible within that building. Occasionally, major events, the catastrophe of losing the Grand Hall, um, could have been a showstopper. It could have been an existential crisis for the organisation. Be but because of the way we've been working, taking every event that ever happened to this building as part of the raw material for the new building, we were able to actually to assimilate that and to make the fire yet another event in the long history of the building. And I think what will come out of that, using what the fire left and remaking the ceiling um, in a more theatrically effective way, I think will actually result in a much more um, potent and beautiful space. Occasionally, a building is interesting for its, its external space and for its location. This is the uh, Theatre Royal at Bath, who spent a long time looking for a space for a children's theatre, spent two years researching with a group of children, building a brief, commissioning the architects with the young people. And they wanted a glamorous space, which taught to the old main house of the Theatre Royal, which we made with them out of felt and plastic and leather um, and coloured light. But to do that, we gutted the whole building. You know, occasionally, these more radical strategies are the right way to go, enlisting the qualities of daylight in the space and allowing the historic building to be a lantern, a playful object um, for the young people and children to express themselves in. And lastly, in a way when all else fails, there is a case for building new, you know, building from scratch. Liverpool Everyman, um, a building very close to my heart, another 10-year project, part of which involved looking at strategies for retaining the old building, recycling, reusing parts of it, all of which proved to be unfeasible, and we came to the conclusion this would be a new building. But in doing so, we recycled about 90% of the old building and built it back into the new one. We tried really hard for this to be an exemplary building, both in terms of its architectural quality and its sustainability credentials. Now, Robert Longthorne's here, who's, who's my brilliant client for that period. And, you know, he will tell you that this process was not straightforward. You know, lots of things we got wrong, lots of things didn't quite work. But actually, the energy that went in to try and to make this, if we're going to build new, if we're going to spend a lot of energy and resource and finance on a building, it had better be exemplary. It had better be the thing which you know, the country, the community can look to as an example of how we can do this stuff. You know, we are in a position to lead this debate as the cultural community. We are probably better placed than anybody to see this picture in the round. So I think it's up to us to take it on board and take it forward. Thank you. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, coming up next is Simon Curtis. He is head of production at Royal Exchange Theatre. Um, he's worked in theatre and event production for 20 years, um, and he is also on the steering group um, for the Manchester Climate Change Agency. Um, they are Their job is to oversee and champion the delivery of the Manchester Certain Future on behalf of the city stakeholders. And they are currently overseeing the development of the Manchester Climate Change Strategy for 2017 to 2050. Uh, Simon also chairs the Manchester Arts Sustainability Team, which is a network of over 30 cultural organisations across Manchester and Salford with a shared sustainability brief and targets. Thanks, good morning, good afternoon. 
Um, uh, yeah, so I'm head of production at the Royal Exchange Theatre. Uh, that's where we'll start the story. It's an organisation with an £8 million turnover. Uh, it gets two-thirds of its money uh, from income, the other third from public subsidy. Um, this year we're expecting half a million people to visit our building and about 200,000 of them will buy, buy a ticket. Uh, I joined the theatre about 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago, 2006, as their production manager and uh, obviously clutching my job description, one of the things that I had to do was chair the health and safety committee. Uh, so I did, and we talked health and safety, but um, what, was, what came out of that meeting was that the people around that table actually wanted to talk about our environmental impact. Back then, it was one of the few meetings uh, in the theatre that involved people from all areas at all different levels. So the Royal Exchange's green journey was started, I imagine, in much the same way as a lot of people, uh, uh, as a lot of people here. Um, and we just kind of got on and did some things. And there's lots of ways we made a difference, but perhaps the biggest story was around our, or biggest story is around our electricity usage. We now in our main building use 41.5% less electricity than uh, the 2006 levels. This is the equivalent of 440 uh, UK homes coming down to 229, and that's based uh, not on those with economy seven like me, where it's boiling at night and freezing uh, when you come in from work. Uh, the reduction on that scale was only really made possible by some capital uh, intervention, voltage optimization that we've already heard about for, for, for the Mac and some, some LED lighting systems. Now we have £67,000 a year, uh, which we're happily spending on our programme or uh, our keeping our heritage building operating. And there's loads of examples from cultural buildings across the country, but this is only part of the story, uh, part of something much bigger. In 2009, in Manchester, residents came together uh, to produce the city's first ever climate change strategy, Manchester, a certain future. And it called for a 41% reduction uh, in CO2 emissions by 2020. In 2010, the Manchester Cultural Leaders Environmental Forum was formed. A, a, a young Julie's Bicycle came to Manchester to put around a table the leaders of the big cultural organizations to talk about environmental impact. Uh, that coincided, unfortunately, with the uh, successive significant changes to our funding, the ones we're still experiencing so vividly today. Those leaders were forced not to think about environmental impact, but how their organisations would survive in a very different, uh, very different world. And what that did is it put a different group of people around the table. It put people like me, the gallery and uh, museum kind of curators, managers, festival organisers, uh, people who run estates and buildings. Uh, and the results were kind of brilliant. The group eventually became known as MAST, the Manchester Arts Sustainability Team, a network of organisations contributing to the cultural richness of Manchester and Salford. Um, the network, as we say, is, in, involves about 30 kind of organisations, funded and private, large and small, sharing their ideas and learning around the sustainable agenda. We report our carbon reduction together as a group. That way we can share each other's successes as different initiatives and capital investment come online. Our last published report saw us having achieved another successive reduction in our emissions. The network's now five years old and thinking about where to go next because our city and its ambitions have changed. Through my success and notoriety, I was invited in 2015 to join the steering group of Manchester A Certain Future. And there I found myself uh, around a table with scientists, uh, with policy makers, with activists, all kinds of people. And uh, to be honest, I found it quite difficult. I was sort of there with my iPad just going, I, what, what, I don't quite understand the science. I'm not quite there with the, the, the history. I don't really understand how the town hall works. Um, you know, my knowledge of kind of long-term urban planning is, is pretty limited. But, but slowly, it began to make some sense. Of course, what arts and culture do really well is explore things. They provide a trusted space where our world is reflected back to us and ideas are engaged with. Cultural, as we all know, is a sign of a healthy society. And our sphere of influence is huge. We communicate with millions of people. 
Manchester now has its own climate change agency, uh, an independent community interest, interest company, set up with three clear objectives. They're to create a strong and unified movement for action on climate change based on a shared understanding of its importance and the need to act. To monitor and report the city's progress on climate change and initiate new projects and funding. In 2015, the city again made its views clear on climate change. When posed the question, what's your dream Manchester? The responses included a carbon neutral city, a green industry powerhouse, economically and environmentally sustainable. As a result, in January 2016, just one month after the Paris Agreement, Manchester published its commitment to climate change to become zero carbon by 2050. The Manchester Climate Change Strategy was launched in December 2016, and this took place not in the Town Hall, but in the gallery of the Manchester Museum. We heard briefly from local keynote speakers, but the event was open to those who'd chosen to attend to tell us what they think, and they did. The Royal Exchange, uh, you may have read about it uh, last week, uh, we've been doing a two-year project to engage with our audience to find out what they think and what they want from the theatre. And here's some of the things they said. They said, I want theatre to challenge me. I want it to challenge all of us. I want a theatre where absolutely everyone feels welcome. I want a theatre to be a safe place for difficult conversations. I want theatres that everyday people can afford to go to. I want theatre to demonstrate more ethnic diversity on and off stage. I want theatre to be a place for children. To know it belongs to the public and to reflect this in everything it does. That gets into communities and listens. That recognises that the audience is part of the performance. I want theatre to connect more with ordinary people. To speak for people whose voices wouldn't be heard otherwise. To be demanding and entertaining at the same time. To allow me to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to be transported into different lives and worlds. And I think this is useful for us today, exploring what a cultural space needs to be going forward. Of course, it needs to be welcoming, it needs to be safe, it needs to be diverse, it needs to be inclusive, and it needs to be accessible. Our buildings are conduits, of course, aren't they, to the communities they serve and so must reflect them. They also need to re reflect the world we live in and explore the options for the one we want to live in, a place for debate. In the autumn of 2016, the Royal Exchange programmed a different kind of events, birth, seven, play, seven plays by international playwrights, exploring the experience of child childbirth across the globe. It was partnered with exhibitions, panel discussions, workshops, live streamed, all of those things. And I remember looking at our audience, and they weren't familiar. Most of them were new, and they were there because they were motivated by the subject. It made us think about how we might want to uh, do things a little bit different going forward. In order for us to develop the spaces that can deliver what our audiences demand, our buildings will likely need to change and keep changing. In order for us to achieve the global carbon reductions agreed in Paris, our cities and all of their buildings have to change. I ask myself, what, what does heritage mean now and whose is it? What are the barriers of these big old stone facades and shiny glass boxes that, that are put up to some of our communities? And to those we are reaching, what are we saying we think about climate change? The Manchester of 2050 will be radically different to the one I live in now, but the seeds have been sown and I can already see the signs of things growing really, really quickly. Policy making, building standards, development of the public spaces, the energy transport networks running entirely on renewable energy. So what does that mean for us here today in our cultural buildings? Well, we need to pursue partnerships that move beyond our sector, engage with our stakeholders on the best way to keep developing our buildings so they can keep playing their fundamental part in, in the low carbon cities of the future. Environmental, sustainable, health, well-being, I, I, don't see the, I don't see the edges, the boundaries to these things anymore. And for us, we need to be advocates, showing that uh, it can be done and it is being done and inspiring others to make even bigger and bolder choices for our future. 
We need to be informing policy and most of all, taking action. Manchester has come a long way since it gave birth to the Industrial Revolution. Its streets are a far cry from the choking smog that you see in these horrendous Victorian pictures that hang in Manchester Art Gallery. Um, it's come away a long way in the last decade, and the next three are going to be really exciting. In, you know, in 2050, I'm going to be 77. I'm maybe living in the sea. I'm, sorry, maybe living in the city, or maybe I'll go to the seaside. I'm going to take a view on that. Um, whether I'll still be visiting Manchester and the Royal Exchange, I don't know. Um, but if, but if I am, this is what I think I'd like to see. I'd like to see a green city full of interesting public spaces and things to engage with. A city full of healthy looking people who come from all over the world. And when I walk into the theatre, I'm struck with what a vibrant, thriving meeting place it is. That everyone there feels like they own it and choose to engage with all kinds of activity that makes them want to think and connect. A place where everyone has travelled by carbon neutral methods. A place that draws all of its energy from local networks of renewable sources. A place where artists, participants and theatre makers realise their work in ways that ensure there's no detrimental effect on any environment in any part of the world. A place where every raw material used won't cause pollution. A place where our responsibilities to each other and our world are continually interrogated. Perhaps most of all, I'd like to see a building in a city that has an abundance of cultural spaces and where everyone is incredibly proud of what they did to ensure that global temperature rises were limited to one and a half degrees. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, Steve, for your earlier provocation. Um, huge amounts of food for thought. Um, I think I'll kick it straight out to questions because really that's why we're all here, is to have a conversation. So does anyone have anything they would like to ask or, or comment as well? As a 70-year-old man from, uh, from the Black Stuff from, from Manchester, I'd like to thank Simon for, uh, for, for if you like, taking us, giving us that optimism of uh, you know, your position as somebody who ostensibly arranged the furniture, so to speak, within the exchange, but, but to you know, the optimism that you now see and you know, your desire to go back to Manchester. I go back fr frequently. Uh, I love the Whitworth, which is uh, the gallery within the park. Maria Balshaw is, uh, you know, has taken that democratic spirit about Birmingham because Manchester is a democratic capital of this country. I, I would uh, deign to say, uh, Birmingham and London are just sort of struggling for a second city place. You know, no, no sort of thing. And it's not because of the uh, the, the capital, you know, which is. Um, you know, uh, raising more value or, or whatever in Manchester, um, you know, which is now, like Birmingham, Birmingham's fifth uh, head of London in terms of uh, capital city prices, you know, uh, places to build homes and whatever. But, uh, but I do think, you know, that culture starts exactly where uh, Steve was, was saying in, in all of those small... Uh, surprising s secret places and you know so just thanks for a wonderful start to uh, to the day oh sorry uh, I should say I'm uh, I I'm from Cannon Hill Park and uh, but uh, so whilst I'm fortunate to have the uh, handle at Cannon Hill Park you can find us on Twitter um, but our, t our tagline is People's Park and I should say that uh, I also worked in a previous life for very small collective that used to put on the green show at the NEC and we, we still uh, exist as climate change solutions so I'm still involved with climate change. Jennifer Patterson, Philharmonia Orchestra. Um, a question for Steve. Um, I was interested to hear about, um, was it the Battersea Arts Centre which started off with three performance spaces and went to eight yeah. till it was? Yeah. Um, and how, 
a little bit more about that process because we're potentially going to be developing a space not for full orchestral performances but for smaller scale artistic experiences and how the actual kind of mechanism behind that work with regards to was it artistically led was it in collaboration with the architects a little bit more about actually how that process worked would be helpful thank you sure um is the mic on yes um so we were commissioned by bassi arts Centre in a fairly conventional way about yeah, about 10 years ago to do some feasibility work. Um, and it's that sort of feasibility study which is kind of a bit open-ended and nobody's quite sure what feasibility study is um, from the client side and the architects can, feasibility study can sort of be anything, anything you want, actually. What, what, what it is, is just an opening conversation and beginning of a, of a creative relationship, if, if, if you're lucky. And, BAC, as, as you know, are, are predicated around the idea of scratch, which is sort of improvisationary process of, of developing work. And we, David Jubb, um, the artistic director there, and, and myself, came up with the idea that we could perhaps try and make a capital project in the same way that a performance is made at BAC, in, in that we would spend several layers of improvisation and conversation before we committed to the final thing. Um, and it's great because, like, you know, like we often say, dialogue is carbon neutral. It's the, the problem is when you start building. <laughs> and so if, if you can talk for as long as possible and as deeply and as creatively and to as great a purpose as possible, often it becomes clear what the, the thing to do is. And often that thing is not the, th the thing that you both thought was going to happen at the start of, of the study. So what we were able to do, in, encouraged by... BAC's ethos was to just keep any kind of solution, any physical solution in peripheral vision and just think around what the building was as a, an environment for performance. And we were lucky in that um, Punch Drunk were about to do a big show at BAC called um, Mask the Red Death where they commandeered the whole building as a performance environment as part of their immersive process, which kind of pushed everything else in the building to, to the edges and into the nooks and crannies. You know, the office went up into the attic and the workshops had to kind of busk it somewhere else. And, you know, so the whole building suddenly became this performance space. And I think that through that process, which I was sort of involved in, in trying to, um, to work with Felix Barrett and David Jubb with the architecture, opening up architecture and creating connections where they didn't exist before, making the building street legal in terms of fire, safety, all that, all that stuff that stops you doing interesting stuff um, quite quickly into the process if you're not careful. We, we, we made all those things happen. So we made the whole building available both physically and conceptually as a performance space. So what used to be a corridor or a broom cupboard was suddenly an auditorium, as it, as it were. And as soon as we made that leap, then the building became this kind of rainforest of possibilities because it's such a rich building, it's so huge. And what, what was a problem in that there's just too much back of house space, not enough, not enough conventional auditoria, became an amazing opportunity. So it, it meant that we could still use the conventional performance spaces as such, but we could bring much more interesting and, and diverse work in, into the small spaces. And we began to see the architectural process as just another production, which could be programmed in the same way as, as, as the building was programmed by the central team. So we stopped thinking of ourselves as architects and clients, i.e. suppliers and consumers, i.e. active and passive, you know, all those things which kind of trip up the dialogue in, in, in these projects. And we started just to think of ourselves as artists. And not only that, we said, let's, what happens if we treat everybody as an artist that's involved in this process, from the building control officer through to the health and safety people to Historic England conservation officers to the local community. Let's invite them all to express themselves and be um, respected as creative voices. And it was amazing, just, just that simple thing, that sort of change of headset from you're not going to be the person that is coming to us with a problem or a moan, you're actually the, the person that's coming to us with a creative idea and a recollection of the building which will frame it 
in a really beautiful and interesting way that none of us had access to in the past because we weren't there when that person was 15 years old and had this experience in that building, etc., etc. And and it was genuinely amazing how, how people reacted and, and it, it streamlined the whole process and got, got ahead of steam going, which is still going on now. So, you know, there, were, there are moments where we said, okay, we, we've, we've gathered raw material, we're now ready to do what feels like a more conventional capital project, you know, let's frame that, let's spend some millions of pounds, you know, particularly after the Grand Hall, you know, that was a particular event, but there were others. There were two or three moments like that where we spent money and we behaved like a conventional building project. But they were kind of, they were kind of stopping points in a, in a constantly evolving process. And the way we see that project is that it doesn't actually ever stop. And the fact that the architects are more or less involved at any given time doesn't mean the project is over. And I, I think that, that's another important thing about cultural projects now is that, that you know, they never, they've, they've never, there's never a point where they've started and they've stopped. They're just in constant evolutionary slower or quicker motion, just, just as the programme and the life of the organisation is. So don't, don't think about the capital project as something which you kind of grit your teeth, tense your stomach muscles and, and it's over as soon as possible and you come out of it with as little agony as you can. It's some, something which ideally is, is to be welcomed and as, as part of another creative process which is happening within the organisation. That was a really long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, can we have... Oh. oh, we'll take that one first and then over. Please, please go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Dave Everett. I'm um, working at the Institute of Energy and Sustainable Development at the Montfort University, and we've just started a spin-off company uh, working with the NUS um, on raising awareness of energy use amongst students in halls of residence. And I'm quite interested in how arts organisations um, running a series of buildings might be able to engage not only their, um, well, their users in general, but the staff and the audiences and visiting companies in the awareness of um, energy saving initiatives and in the awareness of how they personally use energy in their own lives and in their public lives, in their public engagement. So I think the really short answer to that is that that is already happening sort of in cultural spaces up and down the country um, in different ways with um, different organizations interpreting that in whichever way suits them. So you have the more explicit like Mac Birmingham here which who have their green zone um, down in the foyer which actually shows how much energy is being generated by the solar panels. Um, and in other, in other organizations, it's much more subtle than, than that because of the way that um, sustainability has really been integrated into buildings. It's, it's not sort of in your face, it, it permeates as a feeling. Um, but I don't know if either of you want to add something. I think maybe you, Simon, particularly across. Yeah, I think a lot of the, a lot of the mass members publicize, kind of, uh, publicize their environmental policy and practice and what they do with energy. Uh, publicly on their websites and I, I, I think that it's something that we need to do more of I think we need to it, we need to kind of embrace the, the fact that of course it's public money of course we need to be of course we need to be doing that but probably talk about it a bit more openly there's some great examples of stuff already happening some you know phenomenal things that organizations are doing uh, not everyone's talking about it and, and, and I think a lot more people do need to talk about it There's actually an example that I've just come to mind thinking of Battersea Arts Centre as well, because I know the green team there, one of the sort of, they almost use a scratch process for their green team as well. And I know that one of the ideas they came up with was because the building is so huge and it takes so much energy to heat it to try and keep their bills down, they started putting blanket boxes actually in some of the public spaces so that people knew why it was kind of cool, um, but that they could still feel comfortable there. And also one of the other ideas they started thinking about is uh, bodies generate heat. So actually how can we make especially some of these empty spaces feel much more new so that people actually linger and in that way we can almost leech off the body heat of the people coming through our building. <laughs> just, just one thing to add to that is one of the ideas that we came up with with Batsy was to have a weather forecast um, for the production as, as part of the digital um, online presence to say, well, you know, if you come to this performance, 
at this time of the year, you can expect the temperature to be such and such, and that would be anything from like 14 degrees up to 28 degrees. And so, you know, if you're, if you're going outdoors, then you will dress according to the temperature, and that's a perfectly reasonable range of temperature. It, it's only cultural custom and practice that means once you come into the doors of the building, you feel like you have to take your clothes off, at which point you feel too cold, or you've got too many clothes on, in which case you feel too hot. So it's, it's just a slightly different mindset to say, well, let's, let's pretend we're not indoors, and then everybody's kind of happy. Um, and, and the building can operate within far looser temperature parameters. Um, and as long as people feel communicated with, and there's a sense of expectation, people have been able to prepare for that, there's something actually quite nice about that. Um, it's interesting to see an audience where you can see everybody's breath <laughs> in the auditorium. It's actually quite atmospheric. It saves on haze. Right, and then we had... Um, hang on, was there the other questions? Can we take one... Here? Oh. I've got the mic, so am I talking? Is it, yes. is it me? Okay, Could great. You just introduce um, yourself. Yeah. My name's Daniel. I work at the Young Vic. Um, it's brilliant to hear this kind of widening definition of the concept of sustainability to include our local communities, neighbourhoods, and investing in people. Uh, for instance, at the Young Vic with our outreach and participation programme, giving away 10% of the tickets for free, um, doing community productions, uh, versions of the main house shows with um, local people in them. And I know that other theatres represented here and mentioned already uh, do similar work. But, uh, and therefore this joy per kilowatt um, measurement is great. But is there a risk using that, that we may uh, greenwash the uh, sector and say that you know we are sustainable because we do this great investment in local people we do this great investment in the local area we we are a positive multiplier effect etc cetera, etc cetera. you know we put on stories we 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 are a, a brave pioneering place and all, the, all of that and therefore not focus on the actual conventional definition of sustainability in terms of energy uh, efficiency uh, or, or waste creation and therefore kind of not tackle those those issues because we 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 say that we are sustainable because of the work we do in our communities. I think that's an excellent question. Do you want to take it? Should I say something quickly? <laughs> um, I think that is absolutely that does hit the nail on the head because in some ways um, the planet doesn't really care what we're doing on it. Um, it mainly the atmosphere only really cares about how much carbon we're putting into it. Um, I think the way to keep ourselves accountable is by marrying up um, the sort of cultural activity that we do with really solid um, monitoring of our impacts and keeping track of those as much as we keep track of um, our cultural activity and the, the broader impacts that we're having in our communities. Um, so, I mean, I think the Manchester Sustainability Team as a network is an amazing example of that because as a network of cultural institutions, they report annually on their carbon footprint um, and reducing that as well, while also doing all the other bits and pieces in terms of engagement and community. Um, I think within that, though, um, it is also important to remember that sometimes um, as Steve sort of started off with, the standards aren't going to tell us everything because, again, the standards are constructed as a one-size-fits-all. So sometimes, again, the, the measure of kilowatt hour per metre squared is not that meaningful when you have a load of extra metre squareds that you're not particularly using a lot of extra floor space so that a huge building that isn't fit for the purpose that, of what we need it to do as a cultural space um, that is also in and of itself wasting energy, even if it might be using energy quite efficiently. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a constant conversation and I think it is really important to be asking ourselves that question at every corner. It's being remaining critical um, and continuing the conversation at every opportunity that we have. I think the... Um I think the discourse has changed, but the hard fact is that we need to cut our carbon emissions, um, and we need to cut them now, and we need to keep cutting them. But the more, um, the more we look at, I think, sustainability, and the more we vision the future that we want to live in, the more exciting, the more exciting it gets. Um, and the, as I was saying earlier, kind of the, the, the boundaries are less defined at the, uh, at the moment, uh, less defined, I guess, than they've ever been. 
but, but also at the heart of it has got to be um, low carbon technology and low carbon cities. But the more you join all of this together, the more exciting it gets. Yeah, and I think there's also, you know, the other danger is a, a sort of reductive approach to energy, which ends in the conclusion that if there was no cultural sector at all, we'd save quite a lot of energy because all those buildings wouldn't be using up kilowatts. So that, you know, that's, that can't be the answer. The, you know, the cultural sector is about enfranchising society at large to understand, to raise awareness, to actually be motivated, to, to feel there's something worth fighting for, surely. That, that collectively is, is, is part of what we're all trying to do, I think. And if we can balance that with a responsible attitude to, to the way we expend energy in the process, I think that's what I was trying to get at. So it is, it is both and. The best cultural buildings are going to be exemplars of, of low energy and resource use, both embodied energy in their making, which nobody takes any account of at the moment in the metrics, in their ongoing use and in, and in their recyclability at the, at the end of their lives when that comes, again, which the metrics take no account of. So, so our measure is reductive at the moment. It, it is too quantitative. It doesn't take account of both of the wider issues of, of quantifiable data, but equally it doesn't take account of cultural effectiveness. So, you know, what is the voltage of, of, of the building as, as, as well as its resistance, as it were? Can we get one alone? I've had this gentleman here, has been hand up for a long time. Could you just say um, your name and your organisation as well? Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Sagar Samaria. Um, my organisation is uh, So Grow and Reap. My interest is, um, in terms of research, it's natural fibres, like, um, not sort of like, um, sort of natural materials like rock, but more bio-based materials. And when I've been to various conferences about building, then um, the materials that we tend to look at in sort of the northern hemisphere is more like the concrete, the steel and the timber. When I then speak to people from South America or Far East Asia, or the southern hemisphere, then they're sort of reminiscing the bio-based materials like bamboo. When I have these conversations with the people from Far East, they say, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been there for millennia. Um, people in, in the West, it's just like, you, you, you're crazy, you can't build something out of bamboo. It's, um, it's just for that silly scaffolding people just run up and down for. My, my question is, is that in, in an attempt to be all eco-friendly and using tech, are we missing a beat by um, sort of relinquishing the stuff that is the old school, the natural, the traditional? And just to give an example, something which is a bit close to home in Wales, you've got the very good example of the cat centre, um, which, okay, I said China, I said South America, but this is literally almost down the road in Wales, and they've done something there, but are we missing a beat by by not um, going backwards a bit as well. Thank you. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And um, it is interesting because there is a huge architectural movement. Um, I don't know, Steve can probably talk even more about it, but um, also in Africa looking at, you know, all more passive forms of building um, and how those work because in many ways our civilization has built up a particular culture of how we make buildings that is very much suited to the environments that they have been in, um, which means that quite often less technology can be more effective than loading a building full of various systems that maybe no one knows how to use. I'm sure that will come up again as a topic later on today. Um, yeah, so, I think the challenge within that sometimes is, um, I think Steve touched on this very well, is what kinds of skills and knowledge do we also have develop, to develop as arts institutions to have much more intelligent conversations with the construction sector? Um, do we need, how do we work with contractors in that space? Um, one example that comes to mind is um, a venue in East London called Village Underground. and 
they needed to soundproof their roof. And every acoustician they spoke to said, you need to chuck loads and loads of concrete onto this roof to build a sufficiently dense sound barrier for you to be able to do what you want in this space. And um, the owner did not let up and he went around and around until he found an acoustician who went, you can do this with a living roof with a certain amount of soil as long as that soil stays irrigated. So the only time they've had a, a, a noise complaint in the past few years since they've done this is once when the batteries on the irrigation system ran out and the soil dried out. But, you know, it's, that took the effort from him going, I do not want to put a massive layer of concrete onto the roof of my building to solve this problem, even though everyone is telling me that that is the accepted solution and that is the only thing I can do, but I want to come up with something else. So, um, yeah, it's not easy, but I think it's something to push towards. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think the, the, the next generation is going to rediscover uh, natural materials in a big way. I think it's already happening. It's happening in academia. Um, it's happening amongst a lot of young design practices, happening amongst a lot of um, cultural organizations. The, the sticking point is the custom and practice of the construction industry and the way it's set up and also the building economics. So the big contractors that make big buildings tend to like breeze blocks and concrete, which do have certain advantages. You know, they, they are thermally extraordinarily efficient but they're massively wasteful in terms of embodied energy. Um, so again, it's something which doesn't get picked up on the radar when a building is getting screened um, for energy in use, for example. But um, the example of a, a living roof, the Almeida King's Cross project, which I showed you, that was exactly why we did that. Uh, we couldn't afford to use heavyweight sound insulation. We couldn't afford to cool the building mechanically. So we, so we use turf, which does both. So it, it creates a, a soft mat against rain noise um, it, and it provides passive cooling um, to the building as a whole. And it's a kind of art installation for free as a, as a kind of byproduct. So I, I think strategies like that, particularly around timber construction, it is, are getting better, they're getting more efficient, they're getting more mainstream, um, particularly around cross-laminated timber, um, which is you know, it has got its issues, but it's downside better than concrete in almost every way. And I think we're acquiring the skills to do that. And I would say that every, every new build project should start off thinking, why isn't this building made out of zero carbon um, materials? Um, as the first question, and there may be a really good answer to that. It might be economic, it might be technical, but that's the first question and that's the starting point, I'd say. Anna Bright from Sustainability West Midlands. I was going to ask a question to Michelle, if that's okay. <laughs> um, we're obviously aware of the great stuff that you've been doing here on sustainability and promoting your case studies. I just wonder how you will try and maintain the momentum given the council funding cuts that you will see. Yeah, um, yeah, so some of you may be aware we're, we're um, one of many uh, facing quite a hefty cut at the moment. Um, and I think, um, I talked briefly about the voltage optimizer, and we're looking at decisions like that um, to help us save money. And we're looking at different ways we can um, expand our work, um, that's both artistic and commercial, um, to try and bridge the, some of those gaps. Longer term, we also kind of have expansion dreams, and they are dreams at the moment. Um, and because we, we are actually bursting at the seams now. So um, I talked about the, the amount of work that takes place in the building. Um, and we're running out of space. Um, so I think that we are looking that in the longer term, um, hopefully, uh, in terms of expansion to, to um, make us sustainable. And less far less reliant on that funding. I'm surprised nobody's mentioned the G word yet, so I'm going to be the first one to mention government. Um, do you feel that the government has missed a trick 
when it first rolled out uh, environmental initiatives such as photovoltaic panels to businesses and homes across the UK, uh, which originally offered good financial incentives, uh, but did nothing about its large government and local authority buildings, including museums, art galleries, and theatres. Yes, um, in a word, or well, I think we have been experiencing all sorts of uh, uh, things which are just not joined up. Uh, I, I, um, I think our kind of ambitions around kind of climate change have actually, you know, we've, we've never been in a better place with a global agreement. But then you kind of hand that to cultural organisations who've been dealing with kinds of successive cuts and continue to deal with it. It can be really, you know, it can be almost impossible to kind of vision what you're what you're going to do for the for the future. And and I suspect going forward, you know, with the with the global situation, you know, we're we're also going to have to kind of really hold our direction if we if we want to make if we want to make a difference it would be very easy to be sidetracked by you know by by other governments who don't who don't think this is important as perhaps we do, as perhaps we do but yeah in a word yes i think it's it's time to kind of join everything it's time to join everything up yeah i definitely agree with that i i, I guess i'd also just offer a um, a note about um, what some people unkindly call eco bling, and that, that, that sort of icing on the cake, which is photovoltaics, wind generators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, the, the the interesting thing maybe is to start further upstream with the con with the sustainability conversation. And for example, do we need a building? That that's a good question at the start of those conversations. Do do we actually need a building? If we need a building. Why does it have to be as big as we think it has to be? Do we, do, is that really what we want? Why does it have to be made of materials which cost the earth to produce? Um, who, who are setting these criteria? And, and if we do have a building, which way does it face? How does the sun and the wind and the orientation make the building not need as much energy use? How does the way the building is used drive down the energy requirements of the building, how does the fabric of the building waste less energy and therefore at the end of that conversation what is the energy load and how do we meet that energy load through zero carbon strategies of which one is things like photovoltaics and wind generators. So I, th I think it's yes it's important and yes it hasn't been properly followed through and there are all sorts of really straightforward opportunities which haven't been taken. But actually, it is at the end of, I would argue, a much more fundamental process of examination which needs to be gone through before that question necessarily comes to the fore. I think one of the other things to remember is that actually um, up and down the country, particularly in local authorities, you do actually have champions even where they don't always manage to marry up everything. But um, local authorities are ultimately dependent on grants from central government, but within some of them, amazing work is happening on sustainability that also extends to their museums, um, to their other cultural spaces that are local authority controlled. Is there a lack of join up uh, in green policy in this country? Absolutely there is, especially over the past few years. Um, sometimes I think uh, m more cynically so, uh, sometimes I think accidentally so. Um, or at least someone hasn't quite thought through what all the implications are going to be. And I think at that point, it is also incumbent on us as a sector to understand how different regulations and policy are going to affect us and our efforts around environmental sustainability and be in a position to respond to government consultations and actually point out that, hang on a second, this just really isn't going to work. I mean, one of the examples at the moment is... Um, somewhere among the business rates reform, um, a, a strange accident that has happened is that it looks like organizations that have solar panels that are using the power generated by those solar panels on site are gonna see a substantial hike in business rates attached to those solar panels. Um, not those that export the power generated back to the grid though, 
But so within that now, um, you know, it is there is a, a huge response coming from the solar industry, but also from um, environmental NGOs and also from business and industry, where organisations are saying, "Hang on a second, we installed these solar panels based on a particular calculation," and to be honest, a business rate rise specifically for my solar panels was really not in there. So can you please revisit this? And there is a general consensus that it's probably more accident than, than it's been done on purpose, but someone just sort of missed out a loophole. We'll see where it goes, but um, I think, yeah, it's, it is incumbent on us as a sector as well to, to keep on top of some of this legislation and talk up and speak up um, when it seems to interfere with, with some of the work that we're trying to do. One more thing to add. Uh, uh, just for my knowledge in Manchester, uh, we have the Manchester Leaders Forum. I'm probably going to slightly misquote their title, but they're really kind of that, that they're in charge of the city strategy, and they've published their strategy to, to, to 2025. And an astounding amount of uh, their aims and goals are directly linked to climate change, or you can directly link to them. So that it, it, things are moving pretty pretty quickly, I'd, I'd, I'd say, but also they, they they do need to move quicker. Thanks. Um, we probably just have time for those two questions and then we'll wrap up for lunch. Thank you. Um, Stephanie from Nottingham Playhouse. Um, it's, it's kind of a similar point about um, working with your local government, working with local authorities. They may not be moving at the same pace that you want to move at as a venue, or they might be moving faster than you're moving as a venue. It doesn't actually matter as long as you can find the person or people or document or policy or something. <laughs> <laughs> that you could latch on to. Um, I think we'd all say that you, that you can find that way in. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't beat people up because they're not as far advanced as we are uh, or, or they don't do the same to us. You know, sometimes it doesn't happen nearly so much now, but there was a while ago, five or six years ago, there was a definite kind of, I know what this means, I know what that means, I'm going to drop it into every conversation. And actually it's very off-putting for people who know they should know more but don't. Um, and so you just, you just find your like-minded people and try and forge ahead with them. And if you can find out more from some other source, then you can help educate them in the nicest way without wanting to um, appear to be one-upmanship with it. Was it me or was it going somewhere yes. else? No, it was going to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm from Worcester Arts Workshop. So um, I don't know anyone that knows Worcester Arts Workshop. We're in a pretty much sort of falling down building. Um, we've got hardly any disability access and um, it appears to be made out of sponge. Um, so we've gone through the process of do we need a building? Should we move somewhere else? And we've come, yeah, we're definitely... We want to stay where we are and we're about to embark on sort of feasibility study with architects. The ambition that we've got and the thing that we're saying is that we want to be the most accessible building um, in Worcester and we want to be the most environmentally sustainable building in Worcester. Um, is that the right way to be going? Is, you know, is it possible, I suppose? We, we kind of say it because we think, yeah, we need to aim high, but I suppose what I'm asking is, is it possible? Can we get there? Yeah, of course you can, definitely. <laughs> um, it, I would say it's, look at it as a really slow process. Don't necessarily think that the whole thing will be solved in, in one fell swoop. I mean, sometimes it's good to do the thing you know you need to do and then pause, see how that plays out. It's going to be better than what you've got, you hope, whatever it is. So I, I, th I think there's perhaps sometimes a rush in capital projects to get the whole thing over and done with because everybody thinks it's going to be so traumatic and painful. Whereas actually, I, I think if, you know, it's not, even, it's not even what we would normally call phasing. It's just do a small thing, keep the organization nimble, keep going. Don't close your building if you can possibly avoid it. Don't lose the heat of, of the organization in its place, in its community, with its constituency of, of loyal audiences. In a way, that is always the most precious thing. If you can hold on to that by whatever means and communicate with people that you're on a journey and they're on a journey with you and it, and it could take 10 years, could take 20 years, you're not going anywhere, hopefully. So, you know, and then, then I, th I think there's a much more organic and perhaps more fruitful evolution of a project. And, and, and like we are saying about Battersea, it can kind of insinuate its way into your production program or whatever it is you're doing in the building and take its natural place. It, it, it doesn't have to be 
the painful thing that happens to the organization and its audience. It, it can be actually a conduit for all sorts of other transformations and insights if, if you play it right. So I'd, I'd say take it slow, find the right relationship with, with your design team and, and your wider protagonists in the project, um, put it out there, communicate it as hard as you can, and, and think of it in your mind as another really exciting production that you're doing. Because actually the thing that I, I find that cultural organisations often don't realise is they have got all the skills, you know, unusually amongst the, the client body. You, you're incredibly well equipped often to take on capital projects if you reframe it in terms of the thing that you actually instinctively know how to do. So I think there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of kind of um, non-expert trauma which shouldn't be there. Actually, you know a lot more than the architects a lot of the time, so it's, it's good to remember that. Um, the most sustainable, the most accessible in Worcester sounds great. Uh, yeah, I think aim. I think aim really high. I think also um, uh, your building will have to keep changing. It might well be twenty years before there's another pot of money. Our world in twenty years is going to be incredibly different. I think aim as high as you possibly can now because it's going to pay you so many dividends and us so many dividends going forward. But also, it, the, the, also within the kind of business model, kind of continual investment is going to be needed as new technologies, different technologies come online. So, it's, so again, kind of as Stephen's saying, like a flexibility. Uh, it, it, it's going to be really important to, 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 to keep the building alive. Maybe I should just clarify one thing, because it might sound like those two bits of advice are opposite. Um, aim, aim high and think big, and have, and have the overarching narrative, but don't necessarily be tempted to try and do it all in one bite. So secure the direction of travel. Let everybody who's giving you the money understand that this is going to lead to a really extraordinary transformation. But if you can take it slow, which means you can trim at each stage and get them get the maximum ma maximum joy per kilowatt actually is, is is what you're trying to do and to take it a stage at a time is going to help that thank you uh thank you to steve and simon and thank you to everyone who's taken part in the discussion um we are going to wrap up now um and head to lunch Lunch will be served down on the ground floor um it is all vegetarian and vegan um so that um, there are going to be two building tours during lunch. Um, there will be someone stood there next to a Mac Birmingham um, banner ready to take you through the bowels of this beautiful place. Um, one tour is at 1.20 and one tour is at 1.40. If you haven't had a look at the breakout sessions in the afternoon yet, we are going to be splitting across two rooms. Um, so please go check out our registration. For the smaller room, you do actually have to sign up for it because we're trying to keep numbers down. Um, so half of us will be here and half of us will be at the Pinsent Mason um, one, which is just one level down from here. Um, also, um, anyone, could the Julie's Bicycle lot put your hands up? Um, if you want to speak to anyone from Julie's Bicycle, um, this is us. Um, also, Good Energy, who are kindly sponsoring um, particularly the drinks at the end of today. Could the Good Energy lot... There we go. Just just you. <laughs> um, if anyone wants to speak to Good Energy, um, that's your, your man there. Um, and also Sustainability West Midlands for anyone who is based um, around here. Um, great. Uh, yes. Um, so anyone who is leaving us extremely early, please do fill out a feedback form at registration. But for now, um, enjoy lunch and we'll see you all back at two o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>